I want to talk today about something. Um, the title of the message, I guess, if you want to title it, would be Growing and Growing Strong. If you're in 1 Thessalonians, before I read the scripture, I'll just give you the address. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. On uh, July the 11th of this year, uh, we had a deacon's meeting at Preacher's House. And I'm not supposed to tell you the contents because what happens there at the deacon's re- advances and at the deacon's meeting stays there. We have this rule. <laughs> so I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I want to talk about a serious topic we discussed at the deacon's meeting. And it was about uh, plants. We got deep into conversation about plants. And somehow the topic turned to uh, bamboo. And preacher was talking about some bamboo, and then we got to talking about how fast bamboo grows, and it makes a good hedge. So um, sometime later, because of my exciting life I live, I decided I'm going to Google fast-growing plants. You know, I don't have nothing else to do but things like that. (laughs) And the first one that popped up was bamboo. It grew at a rate of 35 inches a day. I thought, that's pretty good once established. So I Google, well, you know, the fastest growing. Right after that was something called a hybrid poplar, which is a cottonwood tree, I believe. And they said it's not unheard of to grow five to eight feet per year. And then right after that was a Leland cypress. They said the Leland cypress grew uh, once established about three feet per year. So, uh, anyway, plants. <laughs> I Google kudzu. Y'all know kudzu, the plant that ate the south. It said once established, it's not a tree, it's a vine. But it said once established, it'll grow a foot a day. And if y'all know what kudzu is, you know if it's, you have property, it's a chore just to keep this stuff down. Um, I found out that the fast growth came from traits that are natural to the plant, such as the bamboo. Some of the fast-growing plants, though, don't have a a long lifespan, such as the hybrid poplar and the Leland cypress. Compared to an oak tree, they don't last as long. They die quicker. And then I was looking through all this. I found out in the forest, the slower the growth the longer the lifespan. The trees live longer because it takes them longer to fight their way up to the canopy and they become sturdy, strong plants. There's an Iranian fable that talks about a a pumpkin vine that grew up next to a palm tree. (coughs) Excuse me. And this pumpkin vine grew and it finally reached the top of the palm tree and the pumpkin vine said, excuse me, how old are you? And the palm tree responded, 25 years. The pumpkin vine started laughing. Ha! Ha, That's funny. It only took me one year to get this tall. And the palm tree said, that's what the other 24 pumpkin vines said. (laughs) In the Christian life, though, it's not the same thing. We all grow at different rates. Some people grow faster than others, some slow The main thing is whether we're growing fast or slow, the bottom line is we need to keep growing. If you're not growing, you're stagnating. You're staying still. You're not moving forward, and you're actually backsliding. There's no such thing as plateauing in the Christian life. You don't ever reach that level where you say, I'm comfortable right where I'm at. If that's where you're at, I hate to say that. That's no different than backsliding. You're either growing or you're not. If your child starts growing, all of a sudden shoots up as a baby and starts growing, then all of a sudden just stops, you know something's not right, unless you happen to be short parents, you know, no. (laughs) But uh, there's something wrong. It's natural for growth. It's natural for people to grow, and it's natural for Christians to grow. There's no reason that we shouldn't grow if we're planted in Christ. We have all the nutrients we need from the Word of God and from the Lord Himself to keep growing, and that's what we need to be doing. Growth is natural and imperative in the Christian life. A while back, I was doing a lot of, I still am, but 
I was driving and I heard a message, how to live the Christian life. And I like what this preacher said. He gave three points that were essential to the Christian life. I also believe that these are essential, but I believe it's the groundwork from which every child of God needs to grow. Um, by the way, it was a Billy Graham message, and I stole three of his points, but not his notes. So if y'all want to look it up, he preached it in 1957. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I took his points as the basis. And um, although we know, like we studied this morning in our life group, our foundation is Christ. Everything should be built upon Christ. And uh, I was telling, uh, talking in the life group, I hate using the analogy of Christ as our foundation because I feel like it puts him on the bottom. But like I was saying, the truth is he's holding us up. And we need Christ to hold us up. But that's when you get saved, you get to that point. Your foundation is Christ, but you have to build upon that. You can't stay at that stage of your life just saying, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm glad, I'm just, you know, I'm just buying fire insurance. We need to grow. There's more than that. That's why people, I believe, live defeated Christian lives because they refuse to go on from there. They get saved, they hit a brick wall, and they're like, I, I'm satisfied right here. And like I was talking about the life group, they'll come to church and they always have problems, problem after problem after problem, like, and they wonder why. And sometimes as a life group leader or pastor, sometimes you just want to gently squeeze people and say, don't you get this? You got to grow. You got to read your Bible. You got to grow. You can't stay where you're at and expect God to bless you. You're not moving forward in this growth. You're stagnating. If a pond doesn't take in fresh water, what happens? It stagnates. Then this green stuff grows. At first, it doesn't look too bad till it turns into that yucky pea soup green looking color, and you don't even want to be around there. The pond starts stinking because it's dying. And that's what happens to a child of God that doesn't take in fresh things from God each day. And uh, we need to grow. The first point that this pastor said was prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17, just simple. Pray without ceasing. Prayer. I hate to say my failures in the Christian life, a lot of it had came from a lack of prayer. And I always, I was just telling, uh, I believe I was t sharing this with some people, I always thought, you know, uh, nobody ever taught me to pray. For a long time I went that way. Nobody ever taught me how to pray. And I found out it's something you can't teach. You just pray. The Lord gives you an outline in the Word of God on prayer, and you just pray. You talk to God. And talking is communicating. It's a two-way street. You have to listen to God too. But a lot of children of God fail in prayer. Their prayer life is very minimal at best. And then they wonder, why is not the help there? Why does this? I used to think the same thing. Why does that person seem to have a wonderful relationship with God? And I'm failing at this. And the truth is, I started watching people's lives and they prayed. They prayed, pray about everything. Leonard Ravenhill wrote, prayer must have priority. Prayer must be the bolt to lock up the night or key to open the day. I pray and uh, my grandchildren, they stay with us in the weekend. And uh, when I'm retiring for the night, which is usually earlier than the rest of my family, <laughs> and uh my oldest granddaughter likes to run in there. She goes, are you going to pray, Grandpa? Yeah. I'm like, we're going to pray. And she goes, okay, I want to pray with you. And I, to me, that's valuable. That's precious. There's nothing like that. And I pray, and one of the things I pray, just like Leonard Ravenhill said, it's the key that locks up the night. Of course, I pray for protection through the night, been praying for protection through the day, protection for our church to help us with uh, all these things that are going around. But we need to pray. 
We have to pray. And as a matter of fact, I need to pray right now because I didn't open up with a word of prayer. So <laughs> we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and I'll continue on. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone that made it here today, Lord. Lord, uh, we just need your help, Lord. We pray, God, as we open your word today that you would help us through your word to have a closer relationship with you, Lord. Not just to say we know you, not just to say we trust you for salvation, but that we trust you in every area of our life, Lord, that we give our lives to you wholly and completely so that we can know how to live the victorious Christian life and to keep growing, never to be satisfied with where we're at. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this. Give us open ears to hear and tender hearts to receive your word with gladness. And I just pray, God, that through your word, you would give us the strength that we need to keep going and to keep growing. Lord, we don't know what happens on tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. And we don't know what's going to happen this Tuesday. But, Father, we know you do. And we already know that you've inhabited our Wednesday. And you know what's up the road for us. Lord, I pray that we all learn to trust you, to love you, and to live for you. For, Father, we're asking all this in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. Charles Spurgeon once asked, why is it that some people are often in a place of worship and yet they're not holy? There's nothing more frustrating than to watch people struggle. I can understand it for a person that's saved recently, you're growing, and that some struggle, some grow quickly, and... Uh, it's an amazing thing to watch a child of God get saved and grow. And we watch y'all too. <laughs> I was telling Melissa and Matt and Roxy and their family, they got saved. And I mean, boom, the growth was amazing. And it's refreshing. It's refreshing to see that, honestly. It's a blessing. Y'all are a blessing to us and encouragement to us. And, uh, you know, that's what you want to see. The saddest thing to see is a person that proclaims to know Christ for at least five, ten years, but their life is the same, in and out, every single day, the same thing. They come to church. It's not a wrong thing to do. It's the right place to come, the place to come to get the help we need. This is the place to come. But they'll sit there and they'll hear message after message after message, some might even be faithful. They might come every single message, might be here on Sundays, might be here Sunday night, might be here Wednesday, but you can see on their face they're wearing the face of struggle, and you wonder why. And you wonder, you try, you want to help, but you don't know. You don't know what to do sometimes. Let me say this. If you don't take the help from the Lord, there's not much I can do. All I can do is teach what God gives me, preach what God gives me. But each one of us are held accountable as to what we're going to do with that. Whether you're going to take it and grow or you're just going to sit there and absorb it, and, but it doesn't get into the heart. It goes into the mind and then once you get out there, the world starts hammering on you and it just slides away and it's gone. So Charles Spurgeon was asking the question, why is it that some people are often in a place of worship and yet they are not holy? Spurgeon went on to answer, listen carefully. It is because they neglect prayer closets. They neglect their prayer closets. They love the wheat but they do not grind it. They would have the corn, but they will not go forth into the field to gather it. The fruit hangs on the tree, but they will not pluck it. The water flows at their feet, but they will not stoop to drink it. What per Spurgeon was saying is, it's right there. It's right there. It's within your grasp. It's like fruit on the tree, but you won't pluck it. 
It's water at your feet, but you won't stoop to drink it. He's saying the answer is prayer. Talking to God. Talking to God. You know why you talk to God? Because that's where your relationship is with God. If you don't have a relationship with somebody, it's because you never talk to them. You don't have that one, and it's hard to have a relationship with somebody you don't talk to. You can't. It's impossible. It starts with talking to God. It's right there. God says, I'm here 24-7. It's not a, a, you know, you call and he's busy. He's always there, and he's always wanting to answer your prayer. He's wanting to talk to you. He's just wanting that one and one fellowship with us. But yet we don't grasp for it. We don't stoop for it. We don't want to go pick it. We don't want to pluck it. We just go through life and, there Jesus, bless this day. Thank you. Amen. And God says, there's more. There's more. I want a relationship with you. I want a relationship with you. We have to get to that place where we have a one-on-one relationship with God. If we neglect our prayer life, we lose sight of our Lord. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom will I trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Let me just ask this, who is God to you? This is what the psalmist was saying. God is his rock, his fortress. He's all this to us, deliverer, he's strength. We can trust him. He's the buckler, the horn of my salvation. He's the high tower we run into for safety. He's there for us, but are we asking for that? Are we recognizing him as who he is? Or do we just treat him as a passing distant relative that will call once in a while at Christmas and Easter? Hey, happy Easter. Merry Christmas. See you next year. You know, we need to have that relationship with God and it comes through prayer. How we view God and pray to him indicates where our priorities are and whether we have the privilege of realizing that God belongs above and ahead of everything. God has to have the preeminence in our life, not a part of it, preeminence. In other words, God is before everything in your life. If he's not, he doesn't have the rightful place in your life, and there's a lot of you still in there, and God cannot work with that. And you'll hit walls every time. You'll hit walls, you'll struggle, you'll have problems. And you'll be like one of them people. Please pray for me. Oh, this happened. Please pray for me. And it's not, like I was telling my life group, it's not the wrong thing to do, ask people for prayer. But that would be a shame if you go around asking 20 people to pray for you and you won't even pray for yourself. That'd just be a dirty shame. We need to pray. We need to pray. Keep God above and ahead of everything. The second point, I'm just hitting these quickly because it's not the message, it's the (laughs) pre-points. The second point of this pastor was Bible reading and study. 1 Peter 2, verse 2, says, am I giving you enough time, Zach? (laughs) All right. I told him, I don't know, I get nervous, I might stay ahead of him. (laughs) As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You know, when you're new, this is for a new saved person. The verse can apply to anyone. If you haven't been reading your Bible, we need to get to reading it. But as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. We need the word of God to grow. We need prayer and we need the word of God. Uh, I was yesterday sharing with Brother Matt about a friend of mine that I had the opportunity to lead to the Lord. And anytime we lead somebody to the Lord, you know, I I don't know, it was told to me, that's the way when I got saved, all I know to do is share that same thing with them. And I was told when I got saved, first book to read in the Bible was the book of John. And uh, I read it one time. 
I got, they had a pamphlet in that thing I ordered where I got saved. And uh, they had a little uh, scripture pamphlet in there. And I read John, read the book of John. And uh, I'll admit, at first it was a little tough, but I read the whole thing. And I wasn't sure I got it that time. And uh, I'm going to say this. It was a different version I didn't know about versions of the Bible. When I was a kid, I was brought up thinking the Holy Bible, there was only one. I didn't know there was virgins. Well, I like the King James Bible, not a version of the Bible. When I found that out, I went to the King James and I read it again. And I'll admit, I didn't get through the book of John without crying, especially when it come to the part about our Lord being crucified. And I just started crying and the Lord saved me. And I knew there's something about God's Word that helps us to grow. There's power in this book. It's alive, and it helps us to grow. And that's the first thing I shared with my friend. And I was sharing with Brother Matt. Uh, we have a mutual friend that I hadn't talked to in a while, and I got to talking to him, and I was telling him about our other friend, saying, he got saved, he's different. And you wonder, does it take? If it doesn't, it's not God's fault. Never. It's either we receive Christ or we don't. And I told him the same thing. Read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. And our mutual friend said, I don't think it took, Carl. He's, he's the same. He hasn't changed. But yet when he talked to me, he was telling me different things, you know, like things I wanted to hear. And right away I knew he hadn't done no Bible reading. And I was telling, uh, talking to him, and we were just talking about him, and he said uh, the last few texts he sent me, he started reading his Bible. The bad thing is he went straight to the book of Revelation. <laughs> As a newborn babe desire the sincere milk of the word, he went straight to lion's meat, you know, <laughs> like strong stuff. But we needed the Word of God to grow. Without the Word of God, I can't believe that a person would be saved and never read their Bible and tell me they've grown. I don't believe I'll see that. I mean, you might prove me wrong, but I'd hate to think there's somebody that's saved five or ten years and say they've never read none of their Bible or at least read through their Bible once. I know it's a big task, but that's God's love letter to you, his word, and shame on us for not reading it. How would you feel if your spouse sent you a letter? How would they feel? And then they see you five years later because they're on a trip somewhere working. They come home and, oh, I never read your letter. It's still here, sealed. It's not, let me clean the dust off of it, you know, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to help. I know some of this sounds hard, but honestly, my sincere heart is to help. This is what helps me, and I just want to be a blessing and a help. If you haven't, don't feel bad. I mean, start. It's never too late. Read the Word of God. Read it. That's the only way you're going to grow is prayer, and you have to read and study God's Word or else you'll stay a child in Christ forever. You'll fall for everything. You won't know. We lose a lot of people. It's sad to say I've seen people go from what we believe, the Bible doctrine we believe, and then go to a completely different doctrine and say, oh, that place treated us better. That place taught us more. I'm thinking that's totally different. You're going from somewhere that teaches you the Word of God and what it was. I'm going to guarantee they never prayed and they never read the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God to grow. When a person gets saved, they need the Word of God or they will not grow. It's impossible. As we grow, we need to desire the meat of the Word. We have to keep growing. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, 
The third point is discipline. It takes discipline. That was the pastor's third point. It takes discipline to pray. If you're not disciplined, you're going to have trouble. You know, you can pray at different times. It don't matter. God's door is always open. But if you don't stand and say, I'm going to set this time aside, I'm going to pray, then you're just going to be hit and miss. It's good to be disciplined. Discipline, for those of y'all that are faithful, you come to church faithfully, what do you think that is? It's because you're disciplined enough to come to church faithfully. It's discipline. And it, you have to be disciplined to pray. You have to be disciplined to, and I don't mean discipline like I'm going to take you aside and spank you or something. <laughs> but you have to be, you know, disciplined enough to know I have to set a side time. Let me say this. For those of y'all that maybe there's somebody in here that doesn't do that, try it. Set a time aside, and let me just tell you how your first day is going to go. You're going to say, tomorrow, 7 o'clock, I'm going to get up and I'm going to pray for 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, don't matter, pray. Set a time. And you're going to get up at 7 the dog's going to start barking. The cat's going to be at your leg. The door's going to knock. Your phone's going to ring. Your spouse is going to get up and start complaining about something. Something's going to happen because the devil knows you're about to grow. You want to grow. You're trying to grow, and the devil says, that cannot happen. I have to do whatever I got to do to stop this. And you'll find that everything's going to get in your way. You say, what do you do? Continue on. Kick the dog, throw the cat out, and uh, tell your spouse, give you five minutes <laughs> kindly, <laughs> and continue. You continue. You just have to. You have to be disciplined to pray. You have to be disciplined to set aside time to read your Bible. At first, I remember hearing a message just like that, and the preacher said the same thing. You're going to have a hard time finding time to read your Bible. And he was right. You have to make that time. And you have to understand that eventually things happen at first. After a while, you just keep faithful to doing it. Keep faithful, and your dog will get on your schedule. Your dog will say, hey, he doesn't want to be bothered right now. You just dump him in the nose every morning at that time. No. <laughs> but <laughs> your dog will know, hey, he doesn't want to play at this time. The cat says, I'm not going to get fed. And your husband or wife say, they're not going to listen to me right now anyway. I'm just going to leave them alone. And the longer you go, you develop a routine, and your household will develop that same routine. And they understand that's their prayer time, and they'll leave you alone. That's their Bible time, and they'll leave you alone. You have to do these things. It is imperative or else we can't grow. All of these are essential to living the victorious Christian life. These should be the basics, the place to get back to when we get off course. I believe that those are the things we need is prayer, Bible reading, and discipline. And let me just say this, if you ever backslide and get away from that, get back to it. Go to that. Ground yourself in those things. Ground yourself and you'll find in the long run, you'll start finding success in the Christian life. If you just stay after those things right there, don't let nothing get in the way of that and keep going for God in those areas and say, I will not be moved from that. That's my ground level. That's where I'm going to be. That's the basics. I got to get that down. But there's more. I want to look at some areas that are going to help us to grow and help us to grow strong, which is the title of our message. Growing in our dependence, number one. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Let me just say this. We've same thing, my life group's already heard this. They, they're probably going to fall asleep right now. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I told them, you're going to hear some of these things twice. But uh, we have to trust in the Lord. 
We have to trust in the Lord. Let me say now, in these times, if you're not trusting in the Lord, I don't know where you're going to go to for trust. You can't trust in the government. You can't trust in uh, anything anymore. We don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday. It could go normal or it can go bad. I'm leaning toward the bad. I don't know. All I know one thing, it's not going to change God's mind. It's not going to change God's heart. He's going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's not going to say, oh, I didn't see that coming. He's the same. His word's not going to change. But I'll tell you what, Christians all over the place, I hate to say this, but there's probably going to be a lot of them running to and fro, scared out of their minds, depending on how this goes. You know, and the bottom line is, do you trust God? Do you trust the Lord? I was talking, uh, I said, in my life group, and I've used this illustration in church. Pastors use it. You know, nobody tests a chair before you sit on it. You trust in that chair. You trust in it, absolutely, 100%. And I don't know if to date, hopefully the chair hasn't let you down, but I have had a chair let me down. <laughs> and it's funny to others. But uh, what if we put that kind of trust in the Lord? You know, where you just plop down. You're like, catch me, Lord. I'm... I'm wavering. Something's going on. I need you, Lord. And we just put our whole trust in him. The Bible says trust in the Lord. How? Well, with all your heart. That means everything you have, you say no matter what. I don't care what this election turns out. It doesn't matter. I mean, I want it to go a certain way. But if it doesn't, I'm not going to be like those people that were last year when uh, Trump won and they're, oh, I, can't, I can't breathe, I'm going to die, I can't even talk no more. And people saying, I'm going to leave the country and they didn't. I wanted them to, but they didn't. They stayed. I mean, I wish when Trump would have won, he'd have said, no, you said it, we're going to hold you to it. Get out. You know, we shouldn't be that way. It don't matter how it goes. If you get the worst news of your life on Wednesday morning, we should be, Lord, thank you, Jesus. This is going to give me more reason to pray, more reason to trust, more reason to stay faithful to you. You know, I heard a pastor the other day I was listening. I, some days I've been driving to Palm Beach uh, or Palm Bay, and uh from Leesburg, so it's about a two-hour and ten-minute drive one way to go work. So I have a lot of time to pray and to listen to a message. And I heard this one pastor, and he said, you know, when this COVID hit, he said within a month, a lot of people were scared to death. And this is what he said, thank God for COVID. And I even almost <clears throat> swallowed. And then he kept on going. He said, I thank God for COVID. I thank God that we have the coronavirus. He said, because I don't know how anybody else feels or thinks about it, but we have seen more people saved because of this. God has a plan. He says, we just need to trust God. Instead, we're looking to other things. We're going to and fro. We're worried about this, worried about that. And God says, just trust me with all your heart. Well, I don't get it. Well, lean not unto thine own understanding. I'm telling you. Well, it makes no sense. Lean not unto thine own understanding. All I need you to do is acknowledge him, not me. Acknowledge him. And the Bible says, and he'll direct your path. Ever have a moment when you don't know which way to go, where to turn? Well, acknowledge him. Do those things. It's a Bible promise. Claim that promise. And God will direct your path. And you just trust in the path. I'm going to tell you what, it's not going to be the path that's easy. It's not going to be the one that you've got figured out because then you're not depending on Him. You have to trust in the Lord. 
the verse says, He'll direct, He shall direct thy path. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When you're trusting in the Lord and the questions of life or problems arise, you run to God and you run to his word and you'll always be running in the right direction because he'll direct your path. You just have to trust him. Trust him. Number two would be growing in my walk, Colossians. I'll go slow on this one. Colossians 2. Verse 6 and 7. It says, As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We need to walk in the Lord. He tells us right there in that verse to walk in him. So how do you walk in him? How do you walk? How do you walk in Jesus? Well, he tells you. He gives you the answers. Rooted and built up in him. Rooted means having its roots planted or fixed in the earth. When you're rooted in Christ, you're grounded in Christ. Remember, he's your foundation. He's holding you up. He's providing you stability. He's providing you the nutrients for growth. He's the one that's holding it all together. You received him. How many of y'all would raise your hand and say, I know Christ is my Savior. I'm saved today. I know that if I die today, I'll be in heaven. Amen. Amen. So that means, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so now you have a command. So walk ye in him. How? Rooted. In other words, bonded, grounded. Your roots, you're firmly set in Christ that no matter what comes your way, it's the same thing as trusting in the Lord. You put Christ first, and you're like, we got this because he's there. He's got this. I'm trusting in him. I asked this question one time in a, in a Bible study I did a while back, and I said, what is it in life that would knock you down if Jesus appeared to you right now and grabbed your hand and from then on, he said, I'm going to stand right here by your side, holding your hand, and we're going to walk through this life together. Tell me, somebody tell me one thing that would knock you down. Most of your answers would be nothing. Yet Christ lives within us, and we don't act that way. More than taking us by the hand, he's within us. He sees what we do. He walks with us. He goes with us. He's with us all the time. And yet we don't act the same way because we can't see him. So we lack in faith in that area. That's where we have to be rooted, rooted in Christ and built up in him. We are to be rooted in Christ because that's where we draw our nutrients for life from. That's the how, now the why. Why? Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If that verse should ever come alive, it should be at a time like this. Watch the news. Talk about cunning, crafty people, deceiving, lying, I mean, every day, you can't turn on TV and there's not a lie. You turn on the radio, they're lying. It's just lies. If you're not trusting in Christ, where does a person turn to? And they listen to this garbage day in and day out, and they wonder why they're so depressed. They don't read their Bibles, but they listen to this garbage. I mean, we need to trust in the Lord. We need to be rooted and grounded in Him, built up in Him. The Bible says that we be no more children tossed to and fro. I mean, people are going back and forth. You know, most people look for a church anymore. They're looking for one that's comfortable. Now, when somebody says that to me, the first thing I think, do you want a, a lounge chair? Or, I mean, when you're talking about comfort, I mean, these are pretty comfortable chairs. And I'm thinking, how much more padding could we possibly add to that? When you say comfortable, 
what they're meaning is, I don't want nobody to tell me about me living the way I want to live. I just want somebody to tickle my ears and tell me that everything's all right the way I am and leave me alone. Don't dig into my personal life. Don't dig into how much I walk for you, how much I live for you, what I do. All I need you to do is just smile and tell me how lovely a person I am living the way I am. I mean, that's what people are looking for. They're going to and fro. They're carried about with every wind of doctrine. And that's why I'm telling you I've seen people get in a church, not get grounded, not get rooted, not get built up because they didn't pray, they didn't study, they didn't read their Bible. And then they get mad because somebody says something like maybe something I'm saying up here today because they felt like I got too personal. I hope I'm... <laughs> I hope I'm challenging you because it's challenging me. And they'll leave. And they'll go to something totally different. And it makes you scratch your head and say, well, why? And the bottom line is they want to get what they want and not what God has for them. Not what they need from God, but what they want. They just want to be tickled. They want to be cuddled. We shouldn't be comfortable in church. We should be challenged, amen? Then the verse says, established in the faith. That means to fix, to settle in a state for permanence, to make firm. When I think about the rooted, the built up in him, and I'm talking about the first part of the sermon about uh, plants growing, uh, somewhere I read about... Uh, the sequoias, those big giant trees in California, the redwoods, and uh, they grow 200 feet high, I don't know, high, big trees. I mean, they got huge. And I was reading about these trees, and I didn't know they had shallow roots. You're thinking, how's a 300, 250-foot tree have shallow roots? Well, these trees, God designed them for a, in a certain way. They you know, of course, the knuckleheads will tell you, oh, that's evolution. These trees learned what to do with shallow roots. And, uh, you know, that's God's design. It's God's design. These roots are shallow. They go no more than five feet, and which amazed me. But what they do is they grow so close together that their roots are entangled. And they rely upon one another to hold each other up. They've developed that because God designed them that way. Just like God designed the church to hold each other up. We're supposed to support each other, lock in together, support each other, help each other to grow, love one another. We're supposed to be established in the face, fixed. Settle in for permanence. When we see a, a fault within the church, and I don't mean, you know, somebody falling away, we need to try to help. Shore up each other. Stabilize each other so that we can stay and keep going. I mean, the wonderful thing would be for all of us to be in heaven together and to get there. Paul said we're in a race. What a great thing it'd be to cross that finish line at the same time. I don't mean like, boom, the church falls and like, oh, yeah, <laughs> trying to scare y'all. But uh, we need to stand together. We need to stand in the faith. We need to be established in Christ. And then it says, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding means prevailing, having in great plenty, in abundance. You know, when you're full of thanksgiving, it's hard to be complaining. It's hard. You can't complain when you're full of thanksgiving. When you're, I'm not talking about Turkey this the November, I'm talking about thanksgiving, giving of thanks. And we're supposed to give thanks all year long. We have so much to be thankful for. I mean, we're thankful that God loved us so much. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross and shed His blood for us. Be thankful for our salvation. Be thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit that helps us. Be thankful for your family. Be thankful for the church family. Be thankful that we have a pastor that we have 
so you don't have to put up with me no more than you do. No. <laughs> You'll be thankful for him when I'm done. No, not really. <laughs> Kidding. But uh, we have a good pastor, a good church. I love the people here. I love everyone here. I love our church. You know, I love my family. I was just thinking uh, the other day, uh, you know, s- several times I think about how blessed I am that, you know, we have grandchildren that still like us. I mean, me and my wife, we're just old people, and they still want to hang out with us. It's amazing. No. <laughs> There's a lot of things to be thankful for. I've seen people complain over the stupidest things in life, and uh, it's amazing. I mean, like Pastor said, the reason we don't vote on things because nobody can make up their mind. But when the color of the walls, the carpet, the seats bother people, there's something wrong with you. And I'm not, I said, I mean, honestly, we're talking about serving God. I don't care if the chairs were rainbow. That bothered a lot of people, <laughs> especially if you have OCD and <laughs> stripes and patterns on the chairs. But I didn't come here for that. I came here to worship God. That should be our focus, to worship God and Him alone, to put Him first, to worship God for He is worthy. Amen? And when it's things like that, that means we're not growing. Number three would be growing in our knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We're supposed to grow in grace, which means favor, goodwill, kindness, disposition to oblige another. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through this because some of this is covered in the other verses I've, I've had, but we're supposed to be kind one to another, have a disposition to oblige one another. We're supposed to show grace. The worst thing is, is a frumpy child of God. I just, you know, one that's just miserable and, I mean, some people just, Their mind is so full of different stuff that they just pass by people, pass by and just, you know, God has more to give. We have something to give. I mean, we ought to extend grace to one another, love one another. That's what we're supposed to do is care for one another. And sometimes we get so carried away, even in ministry, let me be careful, but sometimes in ministry we get carried away that there's a lot of people we walk over, we ignore. And you just wonder if there's one person that comes in here almost with suicidal tendencies and they get looked over. Might be their last moments, their last chance. We need to be graceful, extend grace to one another, love toward one another, because all of us at any given moment are going through something. We're all going through something. We're all handling crisis in different ways. Uh, There's people that have lost loved ones. There's people sick with this COVID. There's people just sick with other things. There's people sick of people. There's, you know, there's a multitude of things going on. And we have to understand at any given moment, we don't know what a person's going through. So be graceful. We need to extend grace. Then we need to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. Do you know the Lord like you know your spouse? Do you know him that well? Do you know the Lord like you know your children? Do you know him that well? Do you know him like you know your brothers and sisters? You know we all have quirks, traits. Do you know God that well? Do you know Jesus that well? Let me just say this. I know Donald Trump. I know Donald Trump. I can go to Washington right now. Well, not now. Later. (laughs) I can get up to the gate that's in front of the White House, that surrounds the White House, And I can hold on to that fence and start yelling, Donald! Donald! Hey, Donald! Donald! As long as he don't know me, I'm not getting past that gate. Do you know Jesus that well? I mean, I know Donald Trump. 
The question is, he don't know me. Does Jesus know you? Do you talk to him? Do you know him like you know your spouse? Do you know him like you know your son, like you know your daughter? Do you know him that well? We need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And more important, he needs to know you. Amen? I've got my papers all messed up. (laughs) Growing in my conversation, number four. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Do we live that way? Does everything that come out of your mouth minister grace? We see that verse sometimes and we look at it as cussing. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And we think, oh, he's talking about cussing. Well, I don't cuss. Well, I had a friend of mine in church. He didn't cuss much. No. <laughs> he didn't cuss. But it was hard to get him to say anything positive. Anything positive. I mean, corrupt communication. It's, what is corrupt communication? It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that, which is good to the use of edifying. If it ain't edifying, it's corrupt. If it ain't building up, it's tearing down. So we have to be careful with that. We have to watch what we say, how we say it. That's how we minister grace unto the hearers. It has to minister grace unto the hearers or else it's corrupt communication. Sometimes you can talk to somebody and they don't necessarily have to be nasty or cursing. But have you ever talked to somebody and you end up leaving discouraged? Like, man, that didn't help me in no way. (laughs) I feel worse now than when I met this person. You know, how you doing? And the first thing out of their mouth is a complaint about something. It's like, oh, I don't need to deal with that. (laughs) Number five, growing in my fellowship. I'm going to go a little faster here. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The Bible tells us we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. That's fellowship. That's coming to church. The Lord Jesus Christ, when we talk about fellowship, as a Baptist, it's natural to think of, oh, man, we're having uh, cakes and food afterward. That's what we normally think. We're Baptists. We like to eat, especially fried chicken. I don't know what it is. I think we're trying to get uh, even with that chicken that, told on our brother Peter, (laughs) but uh, that's what we think a fellowship is. Christ died for the church. He gave himself for the church, and when we forsake the assembling of ourselves together, we're forsaking what the Lord died for, what he shed his blood for. That's what we're forsaking. And uh, the fact that God says the assembling of ourselves together, he doesn't call it a gathering. He says it's an assembling. You say, what's the difference? Well, here's the difference. I have a watch here. I can take it all apart. I imagine at one time it was all in pieces. I can gather the pieces together, but it's still not going to function because it's just the gathering of the pieces. But when you assemble it, that means somebody with more sense than I did took the time to assemble this watch so that it could be a working piece of machinery. That's what the Lord did for us. He assembled us. He didn't gather us. He assembled us together so that we could work together and work well together. That's what the church is supposed to do. You know, that's the difference between assembly and gathering. You know, he assembled us. And thank God for that. Number six, growing in my attitude. 
Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We're supposed to think on the right things to have the right attitudes. What things can you say today are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise? Well, the Word of God is. The Word of God is serving the Lord. I mean, there's a lot of things. Salvation, reaching people for Christ. Think on the good things. I mean, we think in this past a uh, year, we've been through a lot. A lot of stuff has changed in America. But honestly, we have seen a lot of people saved, haven't we? I mean, we've seen people coming to the Lord. We've seen people having a deeper, growing relationship in the Lord. And uh, all this is good. All this is true. It's honest. I mean, it's, it's a good report. It's things we need to think on. In other words, fill your mind with the things that are right. So they're not occupied by the things that are wrong, amen? To have the right attitude, we need to think on the uh, right things such as heaven also. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2 says, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. We need to think about those things. I always think, I often think about how wonderful heaven's going to be, amen? I mean, compared, we, things can go so well in America, so good that we think this is great. But they fail in comparison to how good heaven's going to be. And one day we'll be in heaven. And the wonderful thing is, there's not going to be sickness there no more hurting you know family members are there and you're there forever and the best thing about heaven we're in the presence of jesus christ and uh, that's the things that we need to be thinking on i'm gonna for sake of time skip a little Growing in my character, Galatians 5, and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These are the fruits of the Spirit. It's not like they come and in sections. It's not like, well, I'm growing in love right now. Then I'm going to have some joy. I'm going to try to work on getting some peace. You know, I mean, we treat it that way. But the truth is, listen, that's the fruit of the Spirit. What happens when you get saved? Where does the Spirit go? He comes to move within. Well, when He moves within, all this comes with Him. It's in you. It's in you. And you say, well, why come some people... I don't seem to have a lot of love. Matter of fact, now, there are some people who don't have a lot of joy. You can almost tell by their face. They're miserable, you know. <laughs> and you wonder. The bottom line is we're crowding the Holy Spirit out with the worldly things. We're not submitting to Christ. We're not surrendering to Christ. We're just going about being churchy, having a spiritual appearance, but we're denying those things that God's given us. We're not enjoying our walk with the Lord. We're not enjoying what He's given us. We're not making use of how, what the Spirit wants to do within us, how the Holy Spirit wants to work. And we sit there and we neglect these things and we crowd them out and we have trouble living the Christian life. We're not growing. And it makes it tough. It makes it like we're going through the routines but we're never growing. We're just going through the routines of coming to church. I'm going to end with this last point here. Growing in my going. I went one time on a trip to Pennsylvania. Me, my wife, <laughs> my grandchildren, and my daughter. 
and uh, we rented a minivan. And uh, I thought, well, this is good, you know, because our vehicles were small. And I figured a little more room and family's a little more relaxed. It ought to be nice. And uh, the minivan was great for about 400 miles. And then it seems like the minivan starts getting minier. And about 600 miles, the minivan gets minier, you know. People seem to like getting closer and closer. And I kept thinking, where's this Pennsylvania? Where is this Pennsylvania? I don't even want to go to Pennsylvania. Why am I in this minivan? You know? <laughs> it started getting crowded. And attitudes. Have y'all ever been on a long trip and attitudes? You know, at first everybody's excited. The longer it goes, the little nippies, you know, like, I'm hungry. I got to go bathroom. Just all oh, men, and it's just getting cramped. But then something happened. I seen the signs. Pennsylvania, so far ahead. And I kind of got excited, like a 200 miles. So I don't know, you know, Matt will agree with this, I think. I hope you do. <laughs> but men are like this. When it says 200 miles, to us it translates in minutes, hours. Like, okay, 200 miles. I'm doing 70 miles an hour. If I kick this thing up to 90 miles an hour, not 50 miles an hour, that's four hours, but 70 miles, okay, I go 90 miles an hour. And you start doing this math in your head because you want to get there. And I seen the signs and I started getting excited. I started getting excited about that. Looking forward to my destination. That's what's happening now. Can you see the signs? Can you see the signs? Um, if you can, uh, turn to Matthew 16. I'll go real slow. Bro. <laughs> Matthew 16 and verse, starting verse 1. It says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desiring him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. Verse 3 says, and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites. Ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Let me just say this. Can you tell the times? I mean, to me, it looks like we're closer now to the end than where we've ever been. I'm not trying to scare nobody and make anybody scared, but I, I don't, it could be another 10, 20 years. I don't know. I don't feel it's going to be that long. I think the Lord's coming back soon. I see the signs. And I'll tell you what, as discouraging as this can be for some, I'm looking forward to the coming of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, I know that I know I'm going to have a home in heaven. You know, no one looks forward to death. No one uh, says, oh, well, uh, hit me now. Get in a bus. Just run over me. You know, we're scared, of, we're scared about the transportation there, but we... Love the destination. I'm looking forward to it. You know, uh, we know it's going to come. I can see the signs. And it encourages me. It helps me because, uh, like I said, it helps me to pray more. I want to be more faithful. I want to be right in God's eyes as to the best of my ability with his help. And I'm looking forward to these things. And, I, you know... Some people it scares to death, and all I can say is it's because you're not ready. Something's not right, and you're not ready. But if you're ready, these things shouldn't scare us. I see the signs coming. I'm looking forward to it. We keep hearing about make America great, make America great, and that's a great thing. I went on a trip to South Florida one time. This time it was me and my wife in a smaller car. 
And this is back when my son and my daughter were little. Before I had grandchildren, it was my son and my daughter. And we go to South Florida. We went to Miami, right, to visit her parents because they flew in from Arizona. So, and they were taking a cruise. So we said, well, we'll go see them for a few days, visit with them before they get on the cruise. And uh, we had a rental car. So blah, blah, we had a good time with them. <laughs> and uh, time for us to leave. So we're coming back, and I tell my wife, you know, let's enjoy the scenery. Let's go back. Enjoy the scenery. I wanted to take A1A all the way back to Orlando. We lived in Orlando at the time. So we start cruising. We have this little rented Dodge Stratus car, and uh, I'm actually one of those trips where I was excited. We're just seeing the sights, and you drive so far, and then so far you couldn't drive on A1A, and you had to find another way around. And, oh, this is cool seeing all the beaches along the way, all the sights and everything. I got to enjoying the sights and looking at everything and taking my time. And somewhere along the trip, my wife whispers, we got to get that rental car back by such and such time. And I even drew in my notes. <laughs> I did one of those like, and there again, Matt, doing the math. Okay, I got to get to Orlando. I got this rental car. I got to get that. Okay, if I do 100 miles an hour, go and get off A1A because you can't do 100 on A1A. Well, I don't recommend it. <laughs> what happened is I got so focused on the sights that I lost sight of the destination. I lost sight of the destination, and I lost sight of the purpose and the plan because I was enjoying the trip too much. That's one thing I have against making America so great is that it becomes so great that we forget we have a home that's better than this waiting for us because we get so focused on what we can accumulate here, what we can have here, what we can do here, how far we can go here. And God says, why? You're not going to be there long. You're going to be up here for an eternity. We worry about our retirement. We worry about our investments, where they're going to be, where they're going to be for retirement. And I mean, 100 years at best is all we're going to hang out here. I've seen a few people in the nursing home go a little bit over, not much. And let me just say, it ain't a very quality of life. It gets tougher. We need to keep our eyes on the destination. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord, amen? Again, I'll quote the same verses, Colossians 3, 1, if you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. I believe if we keep these things in mind, these are the things that will help us to grow. Not just be saved, but actually help us to grow and to grow strong in Christ. Amen? We can either keep going and struggling through this life, or we can take advantage of what God has done for us, what He's given us, what He's helped us with, the things He wants to show us, the things, the directions He wants us to go, and we can enjoy it all along the way as long as we keep our eyes on the destination. If we have our focus proper on God and we grow, amen, and we can grow strong. And that's the bottom line. We all want to do that. We should all desire that or else it just becomes a miserable existence of day after day. Ask the Lord to help you. You know, we have altars here, quite a good size altar now compared to the old auditorium. Got good altars and it's a shame that a lot of times they stay bare. So either it gives me the impression that most of us are we right where we need to be or we're acting like we're right where we need to be instead of saying, God, help me. And let me just say this. We're never where we need to be with God. 
We always need to be growing. There's always room for growth. 